Good morning, and welcome to our Surge experience. It's such a joy to have you worship with us today, and we're so excited to be in the house of God and uh, coming to you with a wonderful Surge experience, and we want to encourage you to join in the worship. You know, this is our Palm Sunday, and we're so delighted to celebrate the triumphant entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. Are you excited? I mean, come on, as you're gathered with your family today around your TV, your computer, your tablet device, your mobile phone, and you're tuning into this service, I'm thankful to have my beautiful wife, Pastor Mary, here, and we're just delighted to bring the ministry of Surge Church to you. And you know, on Palm Sunday, so long ago, Pastor Mary, Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem and they were waving palm branches, they were throwing their cloaks on the ground as he passed by, and they were shouting out and they were giving God praise and they were saying, Hosanna in the highest, Hosanna to the Son of God, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You know what's interesting about that is it goes all the way back to a prophetic psalm, Psalm 118, where David was prophesying about the coming of Messiah, and he talks about in there, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and he says, sin now, O Lord, prosperity. And so it's interesting is that with the coming of the Messiah, the people understood there's peace and there's prosperity. And you know, we're going through a shaking right now. Nations of the world are being shaken right now. Our nation is shaking right now, but I want to encourage you not to be shaking. We're going to stand firm in our faith in God. Amen. And we're going to continue to praise God. And we know that Jesus is triumphant. And he, when he comes and when he moves, he's going to bring peace and prosperity again. You know, you look in the news of the economy, the stock market, the virus, the this, the that, everything, the peace is robbed. It seems like prosperity is robbed. But when Messiah comes triumphantly, peace and prosperity returns. So right now in your home, as Mary and I join, uh, join together, as our war surge worship, we join together. We're going to give God praise and we're going to say Hosanna to the son of David. That was their declaration. Right now, make that your declaration in your life, in your home. And you know, we like to start our services out with a surge declaration, as we like to call it. And you know, it's important what you say about yourself. What you say and believe about yourself is more important than what anybody else says. And it's important to confess the right things about yourself and over your family and your home. So let's say this together. I will experience a surge of God's power and grace that will empower me to live beyond my limits. I receive a surge of faith, healing, resources, peace, hope, favor, and promotion to the next level. I'm advancing and I'm not backing up. I'm a blessing to my church and to my fellow believers as we surge forward together. We just invite you to worship in your home this morning. I want to just stand up over your couch, lift your hands, just begin to worship right there with your family. Here we go. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. No, you won't. When I'm broken, and down to nothing I know that you are always up to something good I know that you are always up to something good Come on, say you make a way You make a way Whatever it takes There's nothing your love won't endure I know that The deepest valley, you go before me, you are here. Yeah. For I know you never leave me, your love surrounds me, I won't fear. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something. Oh, that you 
the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain oh. Worthy is the king who conquered Come on everybody say worthy Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy is the king who conquered the grave Worthy is the lamb who was slain Worthy, worthy, worthy Oh, this is amazing grace This is unfailing love yeah. That you would take my place That you would bear my cross What a joy it is to be able to share with you some words of encouragement from the Word of God, where all encouragement really comes from, where all strength and victory comes from. I'd like to share with you what the Apostle Paul shared with the church at Philippi when he told the Philippians, as he admonished them with spiritual authority, this was not a suggestion, this was some authority, when he said, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, Rejoice. Now, that second time he said rejoice, he did it with some great emphasis. And I encourage you to look in chapter 4, verse 4, and see how that's written, how that's stated. And he's studying it with his spiritual authority, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And he said, I want you to realize that this is a key to having the peace of God in your life. Rejoice in the Lord always, not when things are going good, not when things are going smooth. Always our God is is who he is. He's doing what he does. And I promise you, he doesn't change. Rejoice in him always. And the Apostle Paul no doubt learned this from reading the book of Psalms, where Psalms 33, 1, the psalmist said this. He said, Rejoice in the Lord, O you righteous, for the praise of the upright is beautiful in the sight of the Lord. Oh, I'm telling you, you begin to rejoice in the Lord. And God says what he sees is beautiful. And when God sees this beautiful praise and rejoicing, he responds by doing what only he can do. Now, Paul went on to say in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, and this is very important. He said, not only do you rejoice always, he said, but you be anxious in nothing, but in everything. Now, it's interesting. We got always and everything here. So he said, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your requests known to the Lord. And uh, how awesome that is. But then he says this, this is so important. He says, if you will do this, that the very peace of God will, oh, I love it when God says he will, because if he says he will, he will. He says that the peace of God will stand guard over your heart and over your mind through Christ Jesus. The word guard there is a military term that means to garrison around. And so what the, the Holy Spirit's going to do and the power of God's going to do is that it's going to create a military fortress or guard around your heart and around your mind. 
Today, there's so many things attacking your heart and attacking your mind. But if you'll rejoice in the Lord and make your request known with thanksgiving, really believing God, I'm telling you, the peace of God will stand guard and garrison around your heart and around your mind. I want to pray this little prayer for you from Romans chapter 15, verse 13. It's a very powerful verse of Scripture. It says, And may the God of hope fill you with all joy and all peace in believing. Oh, that's important now. The God of hope filling you with, filling you full of all joy and all peace in believing. And he goes on to say there, and that you may abound in hope. The God of hope wants you to abound in hope. And hope is a joyful anticipation of good things coming to you. And may you abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's my prayer for you and your house and my house. And I say to that, so be it.
believe that this morning, that the King is alive. He is well, even in the middle of uncertainty and all of the circumstances that we're facing today. God, we believe that you are alive and you are well. And you are on our side. And Lord, you are working all things together for the good. Lord, that's us. You're working it all together for us, Lord. And so, Father, we pray for our nation. Lord, we pray for our government, God, that you would give them wisdom. Lord, from the state level, the city level, all the way up to the federal level. God, you'll give them wisdom in how to handle this and how to combat this in Jesus' name. And Father, not only that, but you'll give us wisdom, Lord, to know how to handle this and what to do in Jesus' name. We give you praise because you're worthy. You are worthy. You are worthy. We love you this morning, Jesus. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When darkness falls, it will not prevail. Because <laughs> the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Oh, I believe that. My God will never fail.
Thank you, Surge Worship, for ushering in the presence of God today and for your ministry. We hope you are enjoying the Surge Worship this morning. And you know, we are continuing to move forward as a church in this time with ministry and teaching and preaching the gospel and the word of God to his people. And we wanna just thank you for your continued support and partnership during this time. And did you know that God wants to bless you? He wants you to bless you. Not just that he can, but God wants you blessed. And you know, the cool thing about God is he not only wants you blessed, but he has a system in place so that you can be blessed. And by honoring God and His Word and bringing your tithes and your offerings into the storehouse, the Word says that God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you. And in Malachi 3.10, the Word says, when you bring your whole tithe into the storehouse, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. So as you sow and you give into the kingdom of God, God is going to honor His Word and He's going to bless you. And when you live a lifestyle of giving, you're going to live a lifestyle of blessing. And we have several ways that you can uh, give. You can go online at surgechurch.tv slash give. You can text to give by texting SURGE to 206-859-9405. You can set up a reoccurring giving plan online based on your pay schedule, or you can drop it in the mail to SURGE Church, 2900 Dawes Road, Mobile, Alabama, 36695. Thank you for giving and for partnering with us. You're invited to join us for our drive-in Easter service on Sunday, April the 12th at 10 a.m. in our front parking lot. The Bible says that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Even in this difficult season, we know that through His Spirit, we will rise. Be sure to invite your friends and family to gather with us for this exciting service. You can pull into our parking lot and enjoy live worship, prayer, communion, and a message. We will also have drive through prayer and an Easter bunny for the kids. We cannot wait to see you and your family. For more information, log on to our website at surgechurch.tv. Through Christ, we have the victory and together by faith, we will rise. Again, we're so excited to have you tuned in today. We hope you're being blessed by our Surge experience. And as you are tuning in and joining in in the worship and the ministry, we pray you're experiencing the presence of God where you are. Hey, you know what? It's been exciting to be able to connect with people online, and we just want you to be sure to co put comments as you're watching this, especially on YouTube, also by email. We'd love for to hear from you. And any questions you have, we'll, we'll come back in future teachings and broadcasts and specifically answer some of those questions uh, that's pertaining to the ministry and the message uh, of our teachings. So today is Palm Sunday, and we're so excited about ministering a message that directly relates to Palm Sunday. And it's for most Christians, they know Palm Sunday as the day that commemorates the triumphant entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. But for so many Christians, that's where it starts and stops. But today, I want to minister a message titled, The Secrets Revealed in Palm Sunday. You know, I love the fact that what God said he wanted to do in the Old Testament, he did in the New Testament. What God prophesied and things that were prophetically demonstrated that seem shrouded in a mystery or in a secret in the Old Testament. We see that Jesus came and he ushered in a new era and he revealed the secrets. The Bible tells us that eye has not seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man all the good things that God has prepared for those who love him. But that was Paul quoting the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, as Paul quoted that, he went on to say, but God has revealed them to us by his spirit, yes, and even the deep things of God. My point is, is that in the Old Testament, that verse was true, that eye hasn't seen, nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man, the good things God's prepared for us. But in the New Testament, God fulfilled it with Jesus, and he revealed the secrets. And so I love the 
fact that Palm Sunday, everything about Jesus' life and ministry prophetically fulfills everything uh, uh, in the Old Testament that God declared about the coming of the Messiah. And even Palm Sunday, we see there are secrets revealed. In Matthew chapter 21, we pick up the story of Palm Sunday in verses 1 through 11. It says, Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village opposite you, and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything, you will say, The Lord has need of them. And immediately he will send them. All this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees, spread them on the road. And the multitudes who went before and those who followed cried out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into, into Jerusalem... All the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So that even the multitudes have said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. You know, God's word is so amazing. And one of the things I think that is most fascinating to me about the Bible and about the word of God is how it all fulfills itself. You know, it's astounding to see how many biblical prophecies have been fulfilled down to the minutest detail. You know, that really separates the Bible from all other uh, religious books or holy books, if you want to consider them those around the world. It, consider, it, it really causes Christianity and our faith in Jesus to really stand unique in the world because when others make claims, we see the Bible is more than a claim because of the, the intricate prophecies that the prophets of old declared, we see Jesus fulfill them, even down to the smallest things. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 5, 18, for surely I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. And a jot and a tittle were like punctuation marks in Greek. And so here we see that Jesus is saying that I'm going to fulfill God's word. I'm going to fulfill these prophecies down to the smallest thing. And so we know that Jesus did not come to abolish the Old Testament law. He came to fulfill the Old Testament law. And he did more than just fulfill it in a general sense. We see he fulfilled it in every way. And all the secrets that were hidden and shrouded in mystery and pro prophecies that had been given that were types and shadows, those secrets were revealed. And so we see that it would be statistically impossible for any ordinary man to fulfill all of the aspects of the law and the prophets as Jesus did. Nothing occurs in the Bible by chance or by happenstance or coincidence, and nothing occurred in Jesus' life or ministry by coincidence or by chance. From his birth to his death and every element of his life in between, including his ministry, every bit of it was fulfilling the law and the prophets from the Old Testament. You know, the scripture teaches us, uh, and even Jesus said this, that every word should be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. And if you go back and you look, you see that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. So those are two witnesses that speak to Jesus as Messiah. They confirm him as Messiah. But you also see on two occasions, the heavenly father spoke with an audible voice from heaven saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Notice that there's two and three witnesses giving witness to who Jesus was and who Jesus is as our Messiah. And beyond that, we see not only his disciples, but many others were eyewitnesses of his life, his ministry, and his resurrection. These all point to the fact that Jesus fulfilled prophecy, and in doing so, he proved that he is our Messiah. And the same is true on Palm Sunday. Again, most Christians think of Palm Sunday as Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, and it starts and it stops there. But there's so many secrets revealed on this exciting day that happened 2,000 years ago, and we want to bring out these points to you today. Number one was the fact that King Solomon 
rode David's mule. He came riding into Jerusalem on David's mule. We see that when David was near his death, some of his other sons from other marriages, there was much turmoil in David's family. They were trying to jockey and rebel and position themselves to be king. Other political powers were trying to position themselves to be king over Solomon, and they were preparing themselves, and they were trying to create situations so that when David passed, they could upstage Solomon and, and, and assume the, the role of king over Israel. And so when David got these reports, even before his death, he did something unprecedented. Most kings die, and then their heir becomes the, the next king. David did something amazing. Hearing what was the, the political jockeying that was going on to try to undercut Solomon for, to be the next king, David had Solomon anointed king even before his death to ensure that Solomon, who was God's choice and David's rightful heir, would sit on the throne. And we see in 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 38, it says, So Zadok the priest, Naaman the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the, the Cherethites, they went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule. And they took him to Gihon. And then Zadok the priest took a horn of oil from the tabernacle and anointed Solomon, and they blew the horn, which is the shofar, and all the people said, long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, and the people played the flutes and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth seemed to split with their sound. And so we see that Jesus was not the first king to ride triumphantly into the city of Jerusalem. Before him, King Solomon rode into Jerusalem on his father's mule to be enthroned as king. And you know, according to Old Testament prophets, the Messiah would be from the lineage of King David. And so there was this title that formulated, and it was the son of David. And so in the Old Testament, whenever the word son of David was used, we see that that was a title expressly reserved for the Messiah because God had promised David that from his lineage would come an heir, would come some, uh, come a leader, and that would be, and he would be this great king and he would be Messiah. And so we see that this term son of David uh, referred to the Messiah as the anointed one who was to come. And Jesus was the fulfillment of this title. We see this in the very first 17 verses of the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1. It's a genealogy of Jesus proving his bloodline as the Messiah through the lineage of King David. Come on, that's so exciting. So we see that G uh, David had conquered the city and named it Jerusalem. Before that, it was a stronghold by the Jebusites called Jebus. He conquered it, he made it his capital city, and in doing so, it will be the capital city when Jesus returns and he will reign on the earth for a thousand years and we with him from that city in Jerusalem. But we see the secret revealed in what David did with Solomon. David, hearing about what was taking place, wanted to ensure that after him, that his son Solomon, God's choice and rightful heir, would sit on his throne. He told his mother Bathsheba to go to the prophet Nathan and to go to the priest Zadok and to put Solomon on his mule and to take him down to the, to the spring the Gihon Spring in Jerusalem. And if you've ever been there, uh, I've been there, it's an amazing place. Jerusalem comes to a point. There are two valleys that meet at this point. And so David had the prophet Nathan and the priest Zadok take Solomon down to that, to that area, to that point where the spring the, uh, uh, Gihon is and anoint him and then ride him back up into the city in the streets declaring him to be the king and that's when all the people be went, went out and began to shout triumphantly that Solomon is the king and long live the king. And so we see that as Solomon rode back up into the streets of Jerusalem and the people were cheering, on, he was riding on his father's mule. It was a prophetic precursor to the ultimate son of David. Solomon was the son of David who would take over the throne for his father, but the ultimate son of David would be Jesus. And Jesus gives us a prophetic fulfillment of just as Solomon was riding on the mule into the streets of Jerusalem. They said, long live King Solomon. Here's Jesus riding in on a donkey and the people are praising him. 
And that is, we see, such a significant moment. And so we know that today we should continue to praise the triumphant Christ, the risen Lord Jesus, no matter what you're going through right now, don't let the enemy, don't let what's happening around you cause you to stop praising God, cause you to keep celebrating the Lord because Jesus is triumphant. And because he's triumphant, we're going to triumph through this season, not only as individual families, as a church, but also as a nation. Another secret revealed in Palm Sunday was the actual triumphant entry, Zechariah Chapter 9, verse 9, the prophet declared, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. You see, the prof- prophet Zechariah, he, he gave this prophecy under the title, The Coming King. Come on. We see that Jesus was riding in triumphantly into Jerusalem. And he was fulfilling this prophecy that Zechariah had given centuries before. And he was declaring about the coming of the Messiah and the coming king. And in this prophecy, Zechariah, he instructed the daughters of Zion to rejoice and for Jerusalem to shout and praise God. For the king, the Messiah, was coming, riding on the colt of a donkey. Notice that. Now, In this passage, recording Jesus' triumphant entry in the book of Matthew, Matthew actually records that what Jesus did in triumphantly entering Jerusalem was an exact fulfillment of that prophecy by Zechariah. We we see that Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem uh, was fulfilling the scripture. Everything Jesus did was revealing the secrets Uh, that God that had been kept secret from man then but was being revealed to men at that time and has been revealed to us it's so exciting Jesus fulfilled this prophecy to the smallest detail even to the point that he's riding on the colt of a donkey just as Zachariah said he would and it was a donkey that had never been ridden we see that in Luke 19 So again, we see another clear case in which Jesus was directly fulfilling biblical prophecy, proving him to be the coming king of whom Zechariah prophesied. But he didn't stop there. Notice what he goes on to say in verses 10 and 11. He said, I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He will speak peace to the nations. Come on, don't we need that right now? Peace to the nations. His dominion will be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. And as for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. Wow, here we see Zechariah declared that the Messiah would cut off the chariot and the war horse and the battle bow. And what would he do in spite, instead of, The implements of war, he would speak peace to the nations. Notice, the rulers of earthly kingdoms, they they make war and they ride on their horses and their great horses in pride. But notice what Zechariah said, that the, the king of kings would come, the Messiah, and he would come with great strength and power, but he would do it with humility and ride on the colt of a donkey. And in his humility, he would speak peace to the nations. Remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2.17 and when he said of Jesus, he said, and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. I wanna encourage you right now, there is so much torment going on in the world, but we need to celebrate Jesus on this Palm Sunday because he was fulfilling prophecy and as he comes, he brings peace. He is the Prince of Peace and he is speaking peace to your heart and to your life and to your home. We pray the peace of God over our nations and the nations of the world. We see that Zechariah also declared that his kingdom and dominion would extend to the ends of the earth. And we see another fulfillment where Jesus told his disciples in the Great Commission, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. What is it? The gospel of peace. Preach it all over the world and to the very ends of the earth. My goodness. And lastly, we see Zechariah prophesied that Because of the blood of the covenant, God will release prisoners from the pit. You know, Jesus, he came to die 
and shed his blood to pay the penalty of our sin. And in doing so, he created a new covenant between God and men. And just as God brought back the prisoners of Israel when they were captives in Egypt, and just as he brought them back when they were in captivity in Babylon, God, through Jesus, is bringing men back from the captivity of sin. He's snatching men out of the pit. And I pray right now in Jesus' name that even in distressing times like these, we can look to Jesus. He is triumphant. And because of him and because of his shed blood, we have a covenant with God and God is still snatching people out of the yoke of sin and lifting his people up out of the pit. Right now, you might need to stop and just give Jesus a Palm Sunday praise break thanking him that because he's triumphant, we too can be triumphant. We hope you're being blessed. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can know this fire and who showed the moon where to hide till evening whose words alone can catch a falling star well I know my redeemer lives Thank you so much. We're talking about the secrets revealed in Palm Sunday. Whatever God said he wanted to do in the Old Testament is what he did and is doing in the New Testament. And all the things that were prophesied about the future and about Jesus, the Messiah coming, that seemed shrouded in mystery, shrouded as secrets, Jesus revealed those secrets and he fulfilled all those prophecies. The third thing we see in Palm Sunday is the fact that they wave palm branches celebrating the king. You know, in ancient times, it was customary for people to receive a conquering king as he returned to the city by waving branches in the air and taking their cloaks and throwing them on the ground before this conquering king as he walked across or rode his horse across the streets and, uh, and on their cloaks as a way of honoring him. And this is exactly what the Jews did that day in Jerusalem on the day of Jesus's entry into Jerusalem. And so we see that they believed that he was the Messiah at that moment. They, they believed that he was like that second Solomon riding into the city 
of Jerusalem, triumphant, ready to take his rightful place on the throne. And we know this because the crowd was rejoicing and quoting the messianic passage from Psalm 118. We actually started our service today making a reference to that. Psalm 118, verses 22 through 29 says, The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day. Come on, somebody. Don't forget it. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. God is the Lord. He has given us light. Bind the sacrifice with cords to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. You know, the triumphant entry of Jesus was both triumphant and tragic. It was triumphant and tragic. Triumphant for Jesus in that he was fulfilling God's will and fulfilling prophecy, but tragic for the people who looked to Jesus to be the Messiah who would overthrow the yoke of the Roman Empire and restore the natural kingdom of Israel, the kingdom of David. They're looking, they were looking for the Messiah to come as the son of David and restore David's reign and the kingdom of Israel in a natural sense since but they did not realize that Jesus came as a conquering king but it wasn't to conquer the Romans it was to conquer a much greater enemy and that was the hold that sin and death had over people he was riding to take his rightful place not on a golden throne but come on he was riding in to take his rightful place on a wooden cross on Golgotha he was the sacrifice who was to be bound to the altar and die And the great irony was that the messianic expectation people at that time, uh, the desire for the Messiah was at a fever pitch and the Messiah was in their midst. But unfortunately, because their eyes were blinded to the truth and they expected Jesus to be the Messiah another way, they were not able to receive the Messiah that he was Uh, he, He was, and that God had called him to be. Essentially, what Jesus was doing was asking them to follow him all the way to his death while people were looking to follow him to his victory. Notice that. Jesus said, look, follow me and see me all the way till I hang on the cross and die. But they were looking to follow him to give them victory over the Romans. They did not have the spiritual insight that his death was a great victory because he would be raised from the realm of death. He would conquer sin and death for all of us. And this explains why they would receive him as Messiah at the beginning of the week and then very shortly by the end of the week, they're all crying out for him to be crucified. Man, what an amazing turn of events. But in spite of people's lack of spiritual perception, we understand that Jesus' triumphant entry fulfilled God's plan for the Messiah to be a conquering king over sin and death for all mankind. And today, Jesus is triumphant. He is, a, he is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords, and we must continue to worship him. Come on, don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't fear sickness and disease. Don't fear plague. Don't fear that you're going to die. Look to Jesus and live, because Jesus died for you so that you could live in him, and there is protection because of the blood that the Messiah shed. Come on, amen? Praise God. And lastly, the the other secret that Jesus revealed, number four, is that it was the 10th day of Nisan. Now, somebody might say, what do you mean by that? Well, I want to explain it. You see, when the Passover originally happened in Egypt, it was was during the 10th plague of Egypt where the hand of death was going to come into the land and it was going to kill the firstborn, the Bible says, of the people and the livestock. But he told the children of Israel, to choose a lamb for your house. Put the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. You know, what a great message for this moment that we're living in right now. It seems like everyone's scared of of a virus that's spreading like a hand of death. We're huddled in our homes, but I want to encourage you right now. Don't just be huddled in your home in fear. Plead the blood of Jesus. Come on. Put the, if you've chosen the Lamb of God, Jesus, as your Savior, then plead that blood, and the hand of death is going to pass over. And so we see that, that night of the, 
the, the, the, the tenth plague of the death of the firstborn. It's called the Passover. It was the death of the firstborn for the Egyptians, but it's the Passover for the children of Israel because as the hand of death came to their door and saw the blood of the lamb, it had to pass over. Come on, somebody. I've just been claiming that these last few weeks over my family. I've been claiming it over our Surge family, that everyone connected to Surge Church. We plead the blood of Jesus and the hand of death has to pass over. But here is the point I'm making. Passover happened in the Hebrew month of Nisan, and it occurred on the 14th day. But four days before, on the 10th day, God told Moses to tell the men of every house to go and choose a lamb for your house. We read it in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3. He said, tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. And so here we see that uh, the Passover was coming. The hand of death was coming on the 14th day. But four days in advance on the 10th day, God says, go and choose a lamb without spot or blemish and hold that lamb for four days. And so we see that this 10th day of Nisan is so important. You know, dates and numbers, everything in Scripture, again, is without coincidence, every bit of it is connected and it's prophetic. Why is it prophetic? Why is it a secret revealed in Palm Sunday? Because what was Palm Sunday? It, why was it Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of Jerusalem? Is because it was the 10th day of Nisan. On the very same day where men in Jerusalem were going scurrying around to, in search of a lamb without spot or blemish. And they would lead that lamb back to their homes and hold on to that lamb for four days until they could celebrate Passover. We see on that same exact day, the 10th day of Nisan, Jesus, the lamb of God. Come on, somebody. The Bible says that Jesus was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And we see that Father God in heaven had chosen his lamb. Come on, I want you to get that. The same day, where men in Jerusalem were going about to find their lamb, to lead their lamb back to their own homes, we see that Father God had chosen his lamb and was leading his lamb into his house. Because the Bible says as Jesus rode into uh, 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 the city of Jerusalem, he went right into the temple. What is the temple? The house of God. The temple is the house of God. Of God, And so God the Father had chosen his lamb and it led his lamb to his house. Man, that is so powerful. And that lamb, the son of God, was a lamb whose blood would be shed for you and I to have redemption from sins and to have the opportunity to be in covenant with God. What an amazing thing. So when you understand these secrets that are revealed in Palm Sunday and what Jesus was doing was fulfilling prophecy so that the power of God's blessing could be extended to you and me. How can you not also, like the Jews of old, stand up and wave your hands like palm branches and say, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who's come in the name of the Lord. I want to encourage you today that Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. He is the alpha. He's the omega. He's the beginning. He's the end, he's the author, and he's the finisher. And you know, what we're going through right now has taken the world by surprise. It's taken our nation by surprise, but it didn't take God by surprise. Jesus is ordering our steps. You know, think about this. If God can orchestrate history in so many amazing ways so that every prophecy was fulfilled, how much more easily can he orchestrate our lives, even right now, during a dark season? He's still directing our steps. He's still orchestrating events for our good. We're not going to stay here. We're coming out on the other side. But the key is this. You've got to choose the lamb for your life. You've got to choose the lamb for your house. And as you choose the lamb of God, Jesus, and his shed blood, and you receive it by faith, that blood that was shed for our sins, come on, that blood will cover you. And when the hand of death comes knocking on your door, it has to pass over because it must respond to the authority of the blood of Jesus. So today, accept the lamb. Choose the lamb of God on this Palm Sunday. And let the blood of Jesus bring hope, healing, and protection to your life 
into the life of your family. We love you. We pray this message has enriched you and blessed your faith. Come on, we're not staying here. We're going through this season, and we're going to come out victorious because we have chosen the Lamb. We hope you've enjoyed this surge experience today, enjoying the worship, enjoying the presence of God and the Word of God that's building your faith. You know, we are here for you. We want to pray with you. And, you know, if you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior and you've never been born again, now is the time. Come on, if there ever was a time, now is the time to serve the Lord. You know, the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I want to encourage you right now to stop what you're doing and cry out to God and call upon the name of the Lord and welcome him into your heart. If you haven't done that and you want to pray to receive Jesus right now and be born again, I want you to just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Father, thank you for sending your son Jesus. I believe that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he lived a sinless life, and that he died on the cross for my sin. He was buried, and on the third day, God raised him from the dead. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, save me, make me new, cleanse me from my sin, and I commit to live for you all the days of my life, turn my back on my old life, and I ask that you would come into my heart and use me for your glory. If you've just prayed that prayer in faith today, we want to welcome you into the family of God, to the church, but we also want to welcome you into our church at Surge Church. We want to hear from you, so be sure to log on to our website at surgechurch.tv and contact us so that we can follow up and contact you. Hey, if you're needing prayer of any kind, we want you to know that we're here to believe God with you for your miracle. God is touching and he's healing. Come on, this is Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphant entry, and through Christ we're triumphant even over sickness and disease and every affliction that comes against us because the Bible says that the name of Jesus is higher than every other name. And I want to encourage you right now that the name of Jesus is, is, is higher and stronger and greater than coronavirus. Come on, we're not going to be in fear. We're going to be in faith. And God is touching his people. And so we pray for you right now. We plead the blood of Jesus over your life, your home, your family, over your health. And we thank you, God, that you are healing your people. You're breaking every sickness and disease. Lord, you're working miracles. You're bringing breakthrough, not only for homes and individuals, but also for our nation. And we want to hear from you as well today. So again, please call us at 251-633-0033 or log on to our website at surgechurch.tv. Thank you for joining us today. We love you. We're praying for you. And we are here for you. Now stay tuned for our Surge Kids following this. Hey kids, it's Mr. Mark again, and welcome to Surge Kids Ministry here at Surge Church in Mobile, Alabama. Hey, we're glad you're with us today. Man, has it been a crazy couple of weeks or what? I mean, who would have thought? It, I know when I'm at home, I just like find myself asking, what the heck are we gonna do? But you know what? God reminded me that he's not worried about any of this. In fact, he knew exactly what was gonna happen. And you say, gosh, why didn't he warn us and tell us to avoid it? Well, sometimes we just gotta go through some stuff. But you know what? We don't have to go through it sad or afraid or upset. We can go through anything with him and we can do it with joy, and with confidence and with peace. And we can actually share that with other people around us. So we came here today to just encourage you, try to lift your spirits, maybe put a smile on your face. So I brought the Surge Puppet team with me today and they're gonna give us a little skit to maybe encourage you. And it's called Much Afraid. So sit back, relax, and watch this. Good morning, everybody. It's so good to be here today to teach all of you about Jesus. Today, we're going to learn about a time when the disciples were in a boat on the Sea of Galilee and a big storm blew up. Whoa, great timing. Oh no, oh no, what are we going to do? What are we going to do, Grandpa? What are we going to do? Whoa there, Missy, calm down. What are we going to do about what? Didn't you hear that noise? We got to do something. We're all going to die. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Noise? What noise? Uh, that noise. What? 
You mean that thunder? Yes, the thunder. Well, there's no need to get all worked up about a little bit of thunder. A little bit of thunder? A, a little bit of thunder? Th there's a huge thunderstorm heading our way. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? Okay, okay. Calm down. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Okay. I'm calm. What are we going to do? Just relax. Here's what we're going to do. What? Nothing. I don't think I heard you right, Grandpa. Did you say that we're going to do nothing? Yep, that's right. Um, um, I think you're losing your hearing. Uh, there's something you need to know. Oh, yeah? What's that? I'm afraid of thunderstorms! Now, see? You're acting just like the disciples did when they were on the Sea of Galilee. Um, what are you talking about, Grandpa? Well, I was just about to tell the kids here about the time when the disciples were on a boat in the Sea of Galilee when a big storm blew up. The kids? Oh, hi kids. So, what did the disciples do? Well, they were kind of like you. They freaked out. See, even the disciples of Jesus were afraid of the thunderstorms. Yeah, but this story isn't really about them. It isn't? No. It's about Jesus. Well, was Jesus afraid of the storms too? No, not in the least. He was actually asleep in the boat. Jesus was sleeping in the boat in the middle of a huge storm? Yep. Well, at least until the disciples woke him up. Then what did he do? Well, he stood up and he told the wind and the waves to be still. And the storm stopped and the sea became as smooth as glass. Wow, Jesus did that? Sure did. Well, you know, that's all great and wonderful for the disciples, but how's that supposed to help us right now? Well, uh -huh. Jesus is in control of the weather and he still is today. Really? You bet. As a matter of fact, Jesus is in control of everything, even this coronavirus. He's in control of it too, if we'll let him be. So God's children don't have to be afraid of anything. So, huh, Jesus is in control of everything, so God's children don't need to be afraid of anything? You got it. Hey, you know what? What? I remember a little song we can sing to help us remember that God is in control. It's called, He's Got the Whole World in His Hands. Why don't you all sing along with us and let's proclaim it. He's got us all in His hands and He's not afraid of this coronavirus. Are you ready? He got the whole world in his hands. He's 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 got the little tiny baby in his hands. He's got the little tiny baby. In his hands he's got the little tiny baby. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. One more verse. He's got you and me, brother. In his hands he's got you and me, brother. In his hands he's got you and me, brother. In his hands he's got the whole world in his hands. Wow, Grandpa, that's awesome. God's got the whole world in his hands. 
So God's children don't have to be afraid of anything. That's right. And that's something all of you can remember too. Oh no! Uh, Eugene, what is it? We're out of toilet paper! Oh brother! What? Out of toilet paper? <laughs> Man, well you know I was thinking about that. If you're running low, maybe you should pray and ask God to multiply it. What? I'm a dad. It's allowed. See you kids. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>